Good morning. It really is an honor um, to be here. I've said this a lot, and I mean it. I love Kentucky. And I, I've never been here before, and I've threatened my husband a couple times over the past two days that I may not be coming home because it is truly God's country. So thank you for, for having me. Um, what I'm about to share is um, my story, yes, but it's God's story. And so I hope that in the next few minutes that whatever it is that you're wrestling with, whatever it is that scares you or makes you cause pause, um, that you know that there's a God who's far greater than that and a God that loves you more than your anxieties, your fears, or whatever doubts you may be having. You know, I, my story begins as probably a lot of, of stories and lives in this, in this room. I grew up the youngest of, of four children. We went to church. We had a faith. We prayed before we ate. I went to college. I studied art. I got a job that had nothing to do with art and started just living life. And somewhere between the days of, of being under my parents' care and being in college and working, God became an afterthought, a maybe if there was time on the weekend and it didn't disrupt my schedule, um, definitely on Easter and Christmas because, of course, I was home and that would just be a tragedy if I didn't roll out of bed to go to church with my family. So I got married, and at our wedding, we read the following story. I'm sure you all know it. For everything, there's a season and a time for everything under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, time to weep and laugh and mourn and dance. And we left our wedding. And what I didn't realize is that that reading, those words would become a guidepost for our life. There truly is a season for everything. And over the past five years, I've lived in that season. We actually started living that season after our wedding. We went on our way. We were living the proverbial dream. Had what we wanted, did what we wanted, when we wanted, and how we wanted. And I look, about, I look back at that time and my heart cracks wide open. Because nowhere in that time and place was God, for me at least. But what I do know is that God was right there. He never left me. He never left my side. He never turned his back. Despite every single day, every single moment, he was not a thought in my mind. We decided that it was time for us to have a family. And I'm sure you can imagine how well that went. I was working in New York City. I was commuting back and forth. My husband was flying back and forth from Washington, D.C., and we thought it would be perfect, perfect to have a baby. So let's do it. <laughs> it didn't happen. What happened instead is that we were moved to Buffalo, New York. You see, my husband's from the north, and when we, I'm from North Carolina, and so when we got married, he said he would never go below Washington, D.C. And so we had an option of San Francisco, Nashville, or Buffalo, and we shuffled off to Buffalo. But you see, God had a plan, and even though he was not a part of our thoughts, he was not a part of our days, God had a plan in store, and he was preparing our hearts to know him and love him. You see, there is no greater springtime in Buffalo than what we found in Buffalo. The winters are gray, and for about six weeks, the sky is blue and crystal, and the air is clean, and we slowed our lives down. And all of a sudden, we were graced with the prospect of having a baby. And so our firstborn, Frederick William, was born, and after five years of trying 
and nine months of waiting, he was born and rushed off to the NICU. And so for the next 30 days, I spent my days traveling back and forth from the hospital to our home. And I decided it was time to have a conversation with God. And so I made a bargain with God that if he just took care of my little boy, I would be his daughter. I would do what he said. I would go to church. I would just follow his ways. And so God accepted my bargain. And what I know now is that there was no bargains to be made. He knew what the outcome was going to be. I think he was just thrilled that I had pointed my eyes to the sky and said, please help me. Because it was the start of what was to come. Well, we decided, I decided, that I didn't want to go back to work. My husband was not happy. But we did it anyway, and we moved to Connecticut. And life was amazing. I followed a little one and a half year around on his tractor. We played in the yard. And about two years later, Catherine was born. And we were the perfect family. I had two children under the age of two. We didn't have anything because I decided it was good for me not to work and my husband decided it was really great to move to the most expensive, expensive county in the country. And we spent our days in the yard running around and doing things that I know God knew I needed to do. In the coming years, I learned to see the world through my children's eyes. The wonder and awe of fall and spring and summer and winter. They would delight with the pumpkins. Catherine would be mesmerized and announce with a thrill that the crocuses were coming up. And she would run to them and she would pull them out with all of her might and she would hand me a bundle of flowers with roots and dirt and everything hanging off of them and they would grace my kitchen window reminding me that spring had come well the days of yards and swing sets and climbing trees we all know it slowly comes to an end because our kids grow up we were going to church because I had made a promise to God I would go to church on Sunday. And unfortunately, I was half keeping my promise. Because we did go to church, and we did say grace. But 90% of the time, I was sitting in that pew, and I was thinking about what's for dinner, and how was I going to get the laundry done, and all of the things that needed to happen. My husband about fell on the floor when they had the call out for Sunday school teachers, and I raised my hand. And he thought I had lost my mind. What I know now is that God needed me to be sitting in that classroom. He needed me to be teaching my heart that Jesus loves me, this I know. And so I did. I started teaching Sunday school, and then we started going to the ball fields. Our, our story is no different than probably most of the stories in this room, because when my son started playing t-ball, I was convinced he was going to play for the National Baseball Association. And so we would sit beside the field, and we would watch him play baseball, and one day this little girl came running over and she announced to Catherine that they were going to be fast friends. And Catherine was scared. This big, bright, big bow with a big personality became her best friend. They were peas and carrots. Caroline, the bright and bubbly. Catherine, the shy, but oh so wise child. And so they started school together. And when they started preschool, I thought I had get, received a freedom 
that now I could vacuum in the morning, I could put together the snack, we would have the perfect pin Pinterest craft when she got off the bus at lunch. Everything was going to be perfect until Caroline's mother, I realized, had a personality that was bigger and brighter and bubblier than her daughter's. Well, while Catherine and Caroline were peas and carrots, Sandy and I started walking. And in those walks, while the girls were in preschool, I quickly realized that the God that I was bargaining with, the God that I was making a deal with, was not at all the God that knows and loves me. You see, her God didn't sit on a throne, and her God didn't accept bargains. Her God loved her for who she was, when she was, and no matter what she did. And over the coming years, I came to realize that her God was my God. And in the coming years, my time with God was extended beyond that one hour on Sunday morning. I started praying after Catherine went to school, and I started having simple conversations with God on the way to the bus stop. And I know now that in that time and place, God was drawing me in because he knew I needed him for what was about to happen. You see, on December 14th, we lost Catherine. She was among the children at Sandy Hook. And I am not going to talk about what happened at Sandy Hook. We all know who's responsible for that. But what I am going to talk to you about is the way that God came in powerfully and strongly, despite whatever grievance he had every right to have with me, he was there. And what he's done in our lives over the past five years and the five years before that, and the five years before that, in retrospect, is amazing. And I hope that in my story and where I've found God and where I've encountered God, that you will see God in some small way in your life and how he ministers to you and how he heals you and how he wants to be a part. His hand is on your life. We just need to open our eyes to be able to see it. You see, when I sat and I was waiting for Catherine, what I realized is that I will never understand what happened. I will never understand why it happened. I begged and pleaded that both of my children would come home with me that night. And one child came home with me. The other child went home to God. And you know, I miss her. I miss her every day. I miss what would be, what was. But I will never take heaven away from her. And I know, I know in the depths of my soul, I know that there will be a day where she will meet me. And my hope is that when she does, she looks at me and she says, Mama, you did good. And I know that the way that I can get there is to continually see God's hand in whatever is and whatever will be. You see, God protected us, God provides for us, and God heals us. And so what I'd like to do, if you'd indulge me, is over the next few minutes just share with you the ways that God has done just those three things. You see, after she died, we had simple but serious questions to answer, decisions that we needed to make. And at the time, it wasn't that we were sitting down debating on what were the right answers. We were just allowing God to lead us. Because what else do you do when there is nothing left to give and no energy left to live? And so the first decision that we had to make was, do we put our son on the bus and send him to school? Because the world around us was telling us, you don't have to. You've done your job. It's okay to keep him home. It's okay to stay in bed. It's okay to hide in the back of a room. You've earned that right. And the reality is, is no, that's not all right. 
And no, that's not how God wants us to live. Because we all have a purpose. We all have a a gift that we need to share with the world. And by staying home, staying under the covers, and sitting in the back of the room, we do not give God the graciousness and the love to share that gift through us. And so we decided that it was right for Freddie to get on the bus. Because if he didn't get on the bus, then we really didn't trust God. And if we wanted him to trust God, then it needed to start with us. And so we marched him down to the bus stop. We put him on the bus. And we did not tell him all was going to be okay because in his world it wasn't. And we didn't tell him he was going to have a great day because in his world he didn't. What we did tell him is, you're going to be fine. Because he is going to be fine. No matter what happens in his world, no matter what happens in his life, so long as he knows that there is a loving God that is standing beside him and encouraging him and cheering him on, he will be fine. We will all be fine. So he got on the bus, and his dad and I turned around and cried and cried and cried because the last time I put my baby on the bus, only one came home. And that's scary. Well, we got home and my husband said, if that kid can go to school, I can go to work. And in that moment, we started living and moving forward with what we had no idea of what that meant or how that looked or what we were going to do. But we were going to move forward and do just whatever was next. So my husband went to work and I went home And I did not get back under the covers. I was up. I was dressed. What I did do is I sat down and did what I started doing before Catherine died. I opened up my Bible and I sat at my table in my kitchen. And this time it was not a rush because I had to do ironing and laundry and vacuum. I just sat. And some days I said nothing. Because what else can you say? And other days, I read, and I read, and I read. I read his word, and I read his word, and I begged for him to speak to me. And what I found out was in those moments when I was at my lowest, my saddest, my darkest, there is a ray of light that comes in through my kitchen window, and it hits my kitchen table exactly where I sit. And I know that it is God. It is God's hand reaching down from the heavens, saying to me, I know. I am here. I'm listening. And I know. In those moments that I would just sit, I would remember Catherine. I would remember her life, her love, her quirky passions. And what I found is the memories that I had were of a little girl who just loved animals. It didn't matter. She loved them all, and there was no, no, nothing she did to discriminate. She started riding horses. She just adored them. Well, you see, when we wrote Catherine's obituary. We asked for donations to be given to the animal center. We knew that she would want us to give the dogs that she used to give milk bones to a gift from her. What we didn't realize at the time is that we left out one little word, and the word was control. Our pound is called the Animal Control Center. The Animal Center is really an all-volunteer, foster-based organization. There was three people that received over 2,000 gifts. And so we went to them and we said, thank you so much, and how can we help? They shared with us that they thought it would be a good idea to build a sanctuary. Now, I just want to be fully transparent. I'm not an animal 
rescue, welfare. We bought, we bought our dog off the back of a pickup truck in Richmond from Coles, and we thought it was really nice that people would bring their dog. We didn't know up from down. And you know what? Full disclosure, Catherine would bring the bottle money. We have a rule in our house where if you recycled the bottles, you got to keep the money. Catherine would give hers to the animal control center with, by way of milk bones. And I know some of you are probably thinking, that is so, so sweet. It was her ticket in so that she could get in to see the dogs. So we're sitting with these women from this organization, and they said, I think the gifts, the best use of the gifts, would not be for milk bones. I think the best use of the gift would be to build an animal sanctuary. And I had no idea what that meant. And they described it as a place where children and animals would know kindness and love, safety and protection. It would be a place where children would see their innate beauty. They would learn compassion. It would be a place of healing. And as they shared with us this, One of the things that came to mind was one of those clues that were given to me in those days of really having nothing but time with the kids. You see, Catherine and Freddie decided that they would take matters into their own hands and start their own businesses so that they could do the after-school stuff. So they sat on the computer one afternoon and they made Vistaprint business cards. And Catherine asked her brother, What's a title? And in his five-year-old wisdom, he said, it's whatever you want people to call you. And she said, I'm the caretaker. So when they said we'd like to build an animal sanctuary, we said we are in, and we will help you, and we will help build this place, whatever it is and whatever it's meant to be. It's the Catherine Violet Hubbard Animal Sanctuary that we are now in the midst of building and the place that we honor Catherine. We honor God. You see, through the animal sanctuary, and while it will be a place in the future where animals are healed, where people are healed, where kids learn about their own innate goodness, I found that God has used it as a place to heal me and my husband. And while there are days that are hard and there will always be days that are sad, I found a place at the sanctuary where I'm allowed to honor my baby girl. And here's the deal. I'm not the only person who has ever lost a child. And the fact that I can honor mine in such a magnificent way is a gift and a privilege of which I will never be able to thank God enough. He's provided a place where my heart and my husband's heart has been healed. And it's a place where healing has been found in the most unusual places. You see, the sanctuary is situated on 34 acres of land. It was gifted to the foundation in 2014. When we started our quest for where would this place live, we started looking at different properties. And one of the properties was the sanctuary. And I was told that if I was able to see the sanctuary find this home in my lifetime. I had done a great thing. In the course of 12 months, the state legislature voted unanimously to deed the property to the sanctuary. And when the governor handed the deed to my son and said, take good care, his words meant more than he will ever know. 
This sanctuary has been a place where it has been transformed from overgrown and unloved to a place where over 300 hands have just shown up and said, how can I help? What's beautiful about the sanctuary is that we see beauty of the creation all around us. It explodes. You see, now when a crocus pops through at the end of a cold winter, and Connecticut winters are cold, but not as cold as Buffalo, so thank God for that. <laughs> but when a, when a crocus pops up through the ground, I can feel Catherine saying, spring is here. And I am, I am reminded by God that says, healing and life abounds and is anew. And as much as it still pains me to pick those crocuses, we always do. Because sometimes you just have to do it. Every single time I'm up at the sanctuary, at the very perfect moment, there's a rainbow that graces the land. And if anybody's ever up there with me and they do not believe that there is a God who loves them, who will heal them, that will bring beauty from the depths of darkness, they are shown. They are shown. But here's the thing. It goes way beyond creation and God's love and God's provision and God's protection. You see, God has taught me where true joy is found. There was a day and age where I wished for my children happiness, success. We all know. We want our kids to be happy. We want them to be successful. We want them to do what they want to do in life. What I've found is joy, true joy, comes through that tiny twinkle in my son's eyes. You see, his journey has been hard, as all of our journeys are hard. Whether it's the loss of a child or whether it is a diagnosis that you didn't expect, life is hard. And when you can see that small glimpse of Jesus' joy in someone's eyes, you know that you've been touched by God. You see, I call Freddie my brave one. He was there at the school. He was the one that had to tell me he couldn't find her. And over the months that came after, he believed that he had to carry and be a son to his parents and not add any more weight to their world. Well, you can only do that as a little one for so long until eventually it crushes. He had one of those moments, and he went down, and he went down hard, and it was scary. I brought him to his counselor, and he sat, up, he sat in a ball in the corner of her office, and she worked with him, and she talked to him, and slowly he unraveled the ball, and he stood straight, and he realized that while he will always be my brave one, he did not need to be brave. He had a God that loves him and a God that will protect him and a God that will carry him. And it did not, he did not need to carry on the weight that he had been carrying. I asked him later, what was going on in your mind because you scared me? He said to me, he felt like he was in a boat and waves were crashing over him. He didn't quite understand it. And in that moment, I understood it and I understood it well. You see, in those mornings and still in my mornings, I sit and I read. And there's many a times when I am struck with scripture that I don't understand and what I've come to learn, and I'm working on, is that I know in its right time God will reveal what his words mean. That I just need to 
one foot in front of the other. In this moment, I had been reading and I was intrigued by and met with the story of Jesus sleeping on the boat and the waves were crashing. What my baby didn't know is that in those mornings and in those conversations, I was having a hard time with God. And some of the things that I was asking him were, where are you? And why are you sleeping on me? Because my baby is hurting. And do you not see what's happening in my life? I have lost one child, and now you're taking another one. I don't think that I can quite handle this. And if this is what being in a relationship with you means, then I am walking away because I have had it. But I sat, and the sun came through the window, and I sat, and I read, and I was a mom, and I put dinner on the table because I thought, I've just got to keep living. So when my son said it felt like he was in a boat and that the waves were crashing up, kind of like that story where Jesus is asleep, I knew immediately it was his word talking to me, saying, I'm not asleep. I am right here. I'm in the midst of everything that's going on and you think I'm sleeping but I am not because I am going to calm the waves and he has and what we found in the years that have passed is that joy does come in the morning and that when you can look at your family and know that you've been in the darkness and know that darkness is more than likely going to strike your life again and that there is a God that's in the very midst of it. Everything's okay. I don't need to understand. I just need to live in the trust and in the hand of a Heavenly Father who loves me. I thought what I would do is I would leave you today with the prayer that I send my brave one off with every day. And I just pray you don't roll your eyes the way that he rolls his eyes at me. He's 13 now. So my prayer for you, my friends in Kentucky, is this. May your ears be open to hear God. May your eyes be open to see God. May you hear his voice and know his purpose for you. And if you do, that you have the courage to speak back. Amen. <laughs>